it is impossible to spend so much time treating and studying the brain without being in awe of it. The more we learn, the more we are captivated, infatuated even. Why do we dream? How do we dream? And perhaps most importantly, what do dreams mean? 64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Welcome to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. My name is Igor S.F. Walker. Today, we look at this is why you dream. What your sleeping brain reveals about your waking life by Dr. Raul Jandia. So how about you slow down and relax? Reduce all that noise for just a bit. Make that choice and decide to listen. In this video, we look at work by a person who spent their entire life immersed in the brain as a dual trained MD, PhD, neurosurgeon and neuroscientist. Raul performs surgeries on patients with cancers and other illnesses, and he also runs a research laboratory. So we look at the answers to the question, why do we dream? Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I haven't used that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. Dreams have always been a source of mystery. They've been seen as omens, messages from the gods and from our subconscious, from the soul and from the self, from angels and demons. They have changed the course of individual lives and the course of the world. Dreams captivate, they scare, they arouse, they inspire us because they are both so real and so surreal. They illuminate our nature, our interests and our deepest concerns. And in this way, we are uniquely our dreams and our dreams are uniquely us. The brain reverberates with electricity, waves of current moving across the brain every moment we are alive. Dreams are a product of normal brain electrophysiology and an extraordinary transformation that occurs in the brain each night when we sleep following the circadian rhythms, the day-night cycles that biologically govern all life. <clears throat> Dreams are a different form of thinking. It is their very wildness that gives them the potential to be transformative. Dreams are an elusive form of cognition. Because we experience them alone, closed off from the world, a subjective experience for an audience of one. Much about dreams is likely beyond the realm of experimental testing or scientific proof. When we do dream, we transcend our physical selves. We're no longer aware that we are laying in bed or even laying down at all. Our eyes are closed, but we can see. Our body is still, but we can walk, run, drive a car, fly. We are silent but we can hold conversations with people we know and love, alive or dead, and people we've actually never met. 
We exist in the present, but we can travel back in time or forward into the future. We are in a single spot, but we can transport ourselves to places we haven't been to in years or places that exist only in our imaginations. Dreams are our nightly dose of wonder. Now, recurrent nightmares are now understood to be self-sustaining loops of neuronal electrical activity that replay the experience of terror. Dreams arise from our brains, and specifically our brain's electrical activity. The basic understanding of the origin of dreams has long eluded us. We now know all consciousness is powered by electricity, including dreaming. And it turns out that dreaming brain is as active as the waking brain. In fact, the electrical intensity and the patterns measured during certain stages of sleep look nearly identical to when we are awake. Moreover, the amount of energy certain regions of your brain burn while dreaming can actually exceed that which they burn when we are awake, particularly in the emotional and the visual centers of the brain. The waking brain might typically adjust metabolic activity up or down by 3 or 4 percent in the emotional limbic system of the brain. Now, the dreaming brain can boost the limbic system by an astonishing 15 percent. That means dreams can achieve an emotional intensity that is not biologically possible in our waking lives. In fundamental ways, you are never more alive than when you are dreaming. Dreams are a form of mental activity, but they do not require an external stimulus. They're not triggered by sights, sounds, smells, or touch, but they arrive automatically, effortlessly, to experience the wild visual narratives of dreams. Three things have to happen. The first is that the body becomes paralyzed. Our body releases two neurotransmitters, glycine and GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, that effectively switch off motor neurons, the specialized cells in the spinal cord that actually activate muscles. Looking locking down the body allows it to dream safely, otherwise we would be acting out our dreams with our body. The second thing that has to happen before we can dream, the brain's executive network must be turned off. The executive network is composed of structures on both sides of our brain that actually coactivate and are responsible for logic, for order and for reality testing. Finally, the third thing that happens when we dream is our attention turns inward. When this occur, we actually activate wildly dispensed and distant part of our brains, collectively called the default mode network, DMN. Raul also refers to this as imagination network. When faced with a gap in reality, the human brain creates a coherent narrative that simply fills in the gap. Now, if there's any waking state that actually partially overlaps with dreaming, it's actually mind-wandering. When our mind wanders, 
thoughts arise one after another without being oriented toward any particular task or a goal. In fact, we're not directing our thoughts towards anything at all. When you zoom out from one dreamer to 10,000 in a single dream to thousands upon thousands of dream reports and descriptions of dreams dating back all the way to antiquity, contours emerge. For instance, despite massive changes in the way we live, the content of dreams has actually changed little throughout the ages. From millennium to millennium, from generation to generation, many common dreams today are no different than those dreamed in Egypt in the time of the pharaohs or Rome during the time of Caesar. Sleep disorders recorded in China more than 1800 years ago include dream flying, dream falling, and night terrors. Sound familiar? Dreams are remarkably similar all over the world, regardless of what language we speak, whether we live in a city or a rural area, a developed country or a developing one, regardless of wealth or standing in the world. What the imaginative world of dreams gives us, first and foremost, are social experiments. We are social creatures. So dreams provide thought experiments that probe the relationships in our lives, often implausible and other times profoundly moving, building our social intelligence in the process. The central feature of dreaming relies on the most recent and the most prominent evolutionary advance in the human brain and the imagination network the medial prefrontal cortex, MPFC. In our waking life, the MPFC plays a role in our ability to consider both our own point of view and the point of view of others. Now, damage to the MPFC results in lack of empathy, poor social decision-making, and a failure to follow social conventions. It also makes it difficult to change your initial judgment of someone, even after you receive new information. <clears throat> Theory of the mind allows us to consider our beliefs, desires, and emotions, and infer those of the people we are interacting with. Now, what is it that finally gives children the ability to dream? If you think about it, most Children are already going to school and learning to read or do simple math, but they aren't yet dreaming, at least not in the way we think of dreams as a series of scenes. Now, this puzzled researchers who wondered whether young children are having dreams and they were having them all along, but simply did not have the verbal skills to describe them. But this explanation doesn't make sense since children have the ability to talk about events, people, and things before they report dreaming about them. The reality is the arrival of dreams, the way most of us think of them, occurs with the development of visual, spatial skills, not language and memory skills. The key to the ability to dream is how well our minds can visually recreate Reality. There's actually a test you can give a child to determine whether they're capable of dreaming called the block design test. Now, consider this. We now know dreaming corresponds with our development of a sense of self, the essential capacity that allows for an autobiographical memory and identity. Now, no dreams serve to reinforce the self more than nightmares. In a nightmare, the self is typically under attack or facing some other kind of existential threat. A nightmare is essentially a battle of self versus other. 
this is a powerful way to instill the notion in a child that they are separate beings with their own will and their own place in the world. But what distinguishes a nightmare from other dreams? Nightmares shouldn't be confused with a bad or an unpleasant dream. A bad dream is merely one where we would rate it as emotionally negative. You missed the bus or you have to interact with an unpleasant colleague. Nightmares, on the other hand, are characterized by long, vivid, frightening dreams that always wake us up. The nightmare plot usually involves a threat to our survival, physical integrity, security or even self-esteem, and the emotional atmosphere is one of dread. They can also produce intense feelings of fear, anger, sadness, confusion or even disgust. By definition, nightmares force us not only to wake up, but to vividly recall those frightening events. A popular and persistent myth says it is not possible to die in a dream, or that if you do, you will also die in real life. The source of this misguided lore is unclear, but it has persisted across generations. The truth is that you can die in a dream, but you almost always wake up before that actually happens. Approximately every 90 minutes, we go through the full cycle of sleep. Light sleep, deep sleep, and finally rapid eye movement, REM sleep, where we actually experience our most vivid and most emotional dreams. Nightmares are actually universal. And as far as we can tell, we have always been, they have always been part of the human condition. The plots of nightmares are also predictable. The five most common themes across the world and over time are failure and helplessness, physical aggression, accidents, being chased, and health-related concerns or actually even death. Nightmares unfold throughout our lives in an intriguingly predictable pattern. For starters, children experience nightmares an estimated five times more often than adults. Childhood nightmares often involve falling, being chased, or an evil presence. Now, in dream reports throughout the world and across all cultures, children dream of monsters, of demons, of supernatural beings. Now, how can this be? How can children, full of love, who are actually nurtured and protected, still conjure up monsters? Nightmares are actually psychologically taxing and physiologically expensive. They can quicken breathing, they can cause heart rates to spike, and they can trigger strong emotions. All of this requires a lot of energy. Now, if a trait or behavior is energetically costly, and a nightmare certainly is, it really has to earn its keep. In other words, in other words, we would not be expanding precious energy on nightmares if they weren't somehow useful. Based on research in sleep labs, where dreamers are awoken at different times, we now know dreams actually change as the night progresses. Early night dreams tend to include more elements from our waking life. Dreams at the end of the night are more likely to be emotional and actually incorporate older autobiographical memories. And in these dreams, just before we wake up, we are most likely to actually remember them. The tenor of our dreams also shifts Dreams are more negative at the beginning of the night and become more positive as the night goes on.
streams are said to have the potential to either warn us or inform us about our health. In the mid-20th century, for example, Vasily Kasatkin, working at the Leningrad's Neurological Institute, gathered dream reports from more than 350 patients and concluded that physical ailments actually affected dreaming. Of the more than 1,600 dream reports gathered, 90% were actually negative about such topics as war, fire, and injury. Interestingly, dreams of actual pain were very rare. Now, Clara Hill, an influential and now retired professor of psychology at the University of Maryland, argued that dreams are useful in helping people understand themselves more deeply, given that they are personal and can be puzzling, terrifying, creative, and recurrent. But Hill conceded therapists often feel unprepared to work with clients on their dreams because dreams are not covered in their training. During REM sleep, the brain switches off the anxiety-triggering chemical adrenaline. There's no other time of the day when this happens. In this way, dreaming may serve as a sort of exposure therapy, dampening the emotional pungency of the dream experience. As a result, people report fewer negative emotions after sleep and then after dreaming as well. It is actually remarkable that given the trauma most of us will endure at some point in our lives, we do not all get PTSD. The variables of who will get PTSD after exposure to traumatic event and who will actually not still remain elusive. That makes it hard, if not even impossible, to predict who will be unable to shake traumatic memories and the accompanying nightmares, and who actually will move on. But a recent breakthrough in neurobiology has identified a single molecule, neurotensin, that actually could serve as a kind of a molecular switch. What is lucid dreaming? Lucid dreaming is the experience of dreaming and knowing you are in a dream. To lucid dream is to enter a paradox that seems more mystical than actually real, a dual consciousness that straddles the vivid, illogical dreamscape and the insight that you, the dreamer, are both the creator and the actor of this imagined world. In some cases, lucid dreamers are actually able to take dreaming a step further and control the action within the dream itself, a type of a real-time dream navigation. Now, lucid dreaming is not some new age adventure discovered by hippies or gurus. It has been around since antiquity, long before Herney and the modern science arrived on the lucid dreaming scene. The phenomenon was well known. Aristotle actually referred to lucid dreaming in his works in the 4th century BCE, writing on dreams. He wrote, often when one is asleep, there is something in consciousness which declares that what then presents itself is but a dream. Now, lucid dreaming could also have clinical applications. Researchers have reported, for example, that lucid dreams could help people with anxiety confront their fears or their phobias, such as driving or heights or spiders. They actually could practice driving, standing on a high ledge, or allowing friendly spiders to crawl on them in a safe environment, knowing it was only a dream. Since the parts of the brain activated in a dream are the same ones that would be activated 
if we were really engaged in the behavior, it is possible that lucid dreaming could benefit people who have either had a stroke or actually suffered a serious injury. The potential of lucid dreaming is not limited to just therapeutic applications. It can also be used to improve performance. Many athletes use mental visualization while they are awake, using their imagination to simulate different scenarios. Lucid dreams can actually serve as another venue for neurosimulation. Athletes could use lucid dreams to practice aspects of their sports that are potentially dangerous, such as a particularly difficult or challenging gymnastic routine. Remember, when we are sleeping, we're not completely shut off from the world around us. Instead, a process called thalamic gating allows our bodies to monitor sounds from the outside for something alarming, an unusual sound that actually signals danger when noises or some other sensory information is deemed a sign of danger. The thalamus relays the information to the frontal lobes, arousing the sleeper. Researching and writing this book has led Dr. Jindal to see not only dreaming, but neuroscience itself in a new light. In a practice of medicine and surgery, he actually witnessed the power of dreams to persist in a face of terrible injury. He's seen children who have had half their brains removed as a last-ditch resort treatment for seizures, still reporting dreaming. Dreams make themselves heard. More than that, dreams are especially relevant because they do provide a form of thinking and feeling only possible through a unique set of neurochemical and physiological changes, and it is only through dreaming that we actually have privileged access to this mental space. We couldn't think this way during our waking hours if we tried. This is why dreams are worth paying attention to. They can give us insights we actually wouldn't achieve otherwise. They can make associations between people from different times in our lives, between seemingly unrelated events, between what's happened in the past and what may happen in the future. It is because of the powerful underlying neurobiology of dreaming that I am convinced that dreams have meaning and also purpose. That makes reflecting on dreams an important aspect of life lived fully, a life examined. Sometimes dreams are simply impossible to ignore. I believe these are the dreams that demand an intent in interpretation. Dreams like these can provide a portal to your deepest psychological world. But before we learn how to decipher these dreams, a caveat. There's no way to objectively prove if a dream has been interpreted correctly. We cannot put you in an fMRI to get brain imaging to see if your interpretation actually matches up with some objective reality, nor is there a blood test or, is, or some EEG reading that could reveal the answer. Focusing on the emotional and the visual aspect of the dream when trying to make interpretations. Choosing these two elements, the visual and the emotional, because they can achieve an intensity when we are dreaming that is impossible at other times in our lives. First, look at the dominant emotion and the emotional intensity of the dream. Was it anger? anxiety, guilt, sadness, helplessness, despair, disgust, awe, hope, joy, love, belief. How intense was the emotion? Sometimes dreams will produce not one, but many emotions. So focus on the strongest emotion in the dream. The more intense the emotion, 
the more important the dream. Now the second step is to consider the central image of the dream. Like the emotions, the visual centers of the dreaming brain are robustly activated. Dreams link images with emotions as a way of contextualizing them. When you consider the central image of the dream, think of it as a metaphor, an image that serves as a symbol for something else, it is important to remember that dreams are another form of cognition. So while they are often bizarre, they are potentially illuminating in a way that it is impossible to achieve by other means. So throughout history, dreams had been seen as the product of supernatural forces, of visions delivered by gods or the spirits to the sleeping mind that reveal something fundamental about ourselves and the world. Ancient cultures were not entirely wrong to think of dreams as supernatural. Indeed, they are a superpower we all share, a unique world. Each of us illuminates for our own benefit. Today we are no different. We too sense the power of dreams. Dreams give us an opportunity to evolve and to grow. Dreams drive the emotional centers in our brains to an intensity not possible during our waking lives. The imagination network is actually never more active and more free than during our nightly travels in our everyday life. We often think of our emotional brain as something that can get in the way of making effective decisions or being our most productive selves in reality. Optimal decision making relies on emotion. We lack the social and situational awareness without it. Our dreaming and waking selves are actually not separate. Understanding how they are intertwined, we can begin to appreciate the power of dreams. <coughs> And there you have it. This is why you dream. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Do leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read and never stop learning, especially learning about yourself and nature. So. Gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.